Oh yeah, Tim has this awesome theme song. Oh yeah, Tim has this awesome theme song. Hello everybody and welcome to Tim TV. Steve Shanley finally did it. He promised to write me a theme song. You just heard the prototype. And when we're ready, we're, gonna, uh, we're going to arrange it for Big Band. I asked for something like The Tonight Show or maybe a little bit of Dick Cavett. Something where you could actually smell the polyester when you hear it. I say, mission accomplished. Steve, I love you. You are the wind beneath my wings. Mwah. Thank you so much. So, if anybody deserves a theme song, it's my guest for tonight. She played with us about two and a half years ago, playing the Rachmaninoff Paganini variations. And then she was supposed to finish our season last year with a performance of Rachmaninoff Third Piano Concerto. Sadly, the pandemic had different ideas. And so come hell or high water, we're going to get her back. Ladies and gentlemen, please say hello to Joyce Yang. Joyce, how are you? Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. So, so where are you right now? I am in Birmingham, Alabama, which is where I live. Right. Um, where I go in between concerts. And uh, I've been here about four or five years now. And my husband plays in the Alabama Symphony in the bass section. So that's why I'm here. I well, moved here from New York City. So uh, I was really surprised when I reached out to you and I said, so what are we drinking? And you said? The old fashioned. Exactly right. So tell, tell, me, your, t tell me your recipe. Well, I got really fancy once or twice, but um, I'm back to the basics now. I used to go to this bitter shop in, oh. in New York and oh, try yeah. different bitters in there, but I'm, um, now I'm just down to bullet rye <laughs> to begin. And It's faster that way. <laughs> yeah. I don't even use the measuring cups anywhere. Now it's just, you know, save time. I know the ratio. It's just sort of like, you know, where your octaves are. You know, you <laughs> um, and um, regular bitter, orange bitter, one, two, one, two, three, and then um, melt a little bit of brown sugar and um, Luxardo cherry on top. And that's about it. But you do it with maple syrup, right? Instead of brown sugar. It's it's really, I mean, that would take less time also. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, I got this from Jeanette Well. She asked, um, uh, a past guest of mine asked for a whiskey sour. And I found this recipe that used maple syrup, and it's, and it's changed my life. It is it, it's better than simple syrup. It's better than sugar. It's just awesome. So here's to you, by the way. Cheers. Good to see you. Thank Cheers. you for saying yes, by the way. So... Oh, I've had a couple of these already. Do you want to do something funny and silly? Uh-oh. Be careful what... <laughs> What's that? You want? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so now that I have an awesome theme song, I want to use it as though I'm um, introducing you on a talk show. So, Ed, can, do you have the music standing by? Okay. So, uh, Joyce, can you go off camera? And then when I introduce you, I want you to come back on camera and pretend you've got 50,000 people and go like, do the lounge lizard thing like, hey, hey, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Uh, yeah, because okay? I do it every time I come on stage. Yeah, yeah, okay. Now, get, get out of the camera. Uh, get, up, okay. get, out, get off screen here. Okay, I put, a, uh, put the full camera on me. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Joyce Yang! <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> All right, take that out. How was that? So, was that completely ridiculous, Ed? Yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah, does it look good, or are you lying to me again? Oh, never. All right. Okay. Well, let's I get back to things here. I can't hear the music. I might do better if I could hear it. I'll go study it. Maybe next time I can do a little better job. Uh, I will one up you on this. So, uh, when you come and perform with us, and it's going to be sooner oh, than later. Oh. I want you to learn my theme song and for your encore, play a theme and variations. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> Just improvise on the spot. Oh, yeah. Sure. How hard could that be? So, <laughs> where to begin? I am so glad because you're so fun to talk to. Um, last week, I had a young artist who just won the Tchaikovsky competition on cello. And so I want to start there because your career started as a silver medalist of the Van Cliburn competition. So let's talk about the difference between preparing and performing in a competition versus being a professional and playing every weekend or so. 
I think the best advice I got from my teacher going into the competition was that, you know, play for the competition as if you're playing your own concert. And I think that was very um, wonderful advice because when you're competing, I feel like your uh, mental state is sort of like, I have something to prove. I'm going to show you how good I am. And it, that really takes away from um, really showing what is in your heart, being vulnerable, really making music because you care. You're sort of like, look what I can do. And that's a totally different mindset. So she said, really perform like you're walking into your living room and all these people love you already and you are playing your favorite piece and they've never heard it before. So introduce it to them the best you can. So I think that approach was good. Uh, but competition is a competition because, I mean, I can't ignore the fact that in the first tier, there's like six to eight people with the lights on, with the little lamps, and you know where the judges are, and you know every, you know, you're being judged every note you play. So mm, it was extremely nerve-wracking, and one of the most nerve-wracking two weeks of my life. Uh, it's, it's actually a great preparation for real life. I didn't believe them at the time when they were like, oh, it's going to be so much tougher when you win a medal and go out there and you have to do this all the time. And I said, no, 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 it's totally different. Competing is awful. And giving your concerts, it's, it's a joyous occasion every time. But what it does prepare you for is having to play different pieces all the time. So in the competition, I had to play like five hours of repertoire. And as soon as they put that medal around my neck, um, I was like, I was playing five different concerti in two and a half weeks, three of which I have never played. And, you know, going through the competition makes you tougher. And, um, and you feel like you have that boost from the competition, like someone thought I was good enough for me to walk out to the world and deliver what I can. So it, um, it was a great stepping stone um, in a way, uh, but it's, it's still, um, still very shocking to go from few concerts here and there to having to perform every weekend, multiple times a week and have people sit there and, um, and have that title behind you, it's, it's, um, it's kind of a lot of pressure sure. when people are like, people bought tickets because they want to hear a winner. And it's like, let's see what she can do. Um, you know, it's that kind of mentality. And I feel like, I, I hope no one asks for their money back. You know, <laughs> this kind of backstage, you're feeling all the inadequacies <clears throat> and, you know, you're freaking out. Right. It, or less so it's it's tough to to do the competition and go out to the world and pretend like it's it's a totally normal thing and you're having the time of your life which you are but it's kind of a crazy roller coaster that you're you know hanging in there for dear life so you don't fall off the mountain so, so say a few things about uh changing your mental space but you know if you know if you're playing a Bach partita and then you're turning around and playing Prokofiev and then following like with Chopin. I mean, I mean that's a, first of all, it's all diff difficult for various different reasons. But sometimes you're required to turn on a dime. How difficult is that to like change your mindset as you approach different repertoire that's coming at you at a furious pace? You have to be kind of a nut to compartmentalize. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what, how do you really feel? <laughs> like you have multi-personality syndrome you know it's like the Prokofiev concerto Joyce is not here right now because I'm Mozart Joyce and you know it, you can't have these two worlds collide because it just becomes more overwhelming it's like I can't worry about my concert in three days because tonight I gotta do something totally different from what is coming later and I think that really is the hardest thing about touring and having a lot of concerts because um, everyone wants to hear something slightly different repertoire wise. And every day I kind of, 
there is a very early morning time, which doesn't exist now. I wake up at noon at home, but um, when I am touring, before the 10 o'clock morning rehearsal, uh, I have to spend that early morning, get to the hall early and play something I'm not gonna play later tonight. I have to go sort of look two weeks, three weeks, two years down the line and either sight read something for the first time or work on my recital repertoire that's happening in 10 months because it, none of this happens overnight. And in that 30 minutes, you know, I have my clock counting down. It's like, when that goes off, it's like, I have to abandon this current project and move on to the next thing that I have to focus on. So it's like the time timer's on. And for that moment, nothing else exists except for this new thing I have to learn. And then when that goes off and then I get into the rehearsal mode for that day, you know, that is the hardest thing I think that I have to do. Sometimes I'm so overwhelmed at my immediate task that there's no room for me to think about anything else, but you have to, because it's like, if you skip a day, if you skip two days, it's sort of like exercising, it catches up to you. Sure. And then you never want to do it. You're just like doing things last minute and barely learning it and going to play it. And then the next thing falls and this sort of cycle becomes, you know, pretty, uh, pretty scary. And, and you'll be like, walking on eggshells, not like performing like you need it. Right. You know, I think that's what uh, a lot of lay people find so fascinating, because I think in their mind's eye, they, th they think that artists are like woodshedding all the way up until the performance. When in fact, you're perform you're practicing, uh, you know, the, the concerto that night is already in the hands, it's in the bag, you're actually performing for like you just said, a week or two, or maybe even a year or two in advance. And so uh, having the discipline to do you have a hard time with that sort of discipline because you have this you have this concert coming up? I mean, it's got to be distracting. Or I guess with practice, does it it does it does it take practice to practice well? I guess. Yeah, you have to um, create really good habits so things are ready when they're supposed to be ready. I want to say though, what we were gonna do, Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto. I do not practice anything else when I have to perform Rock Money No. 3rd because no matter how many times I came back to it, it still takes every little brain cell and I'm like, okay, all my brain cells, we have to go to work today because <laughs> uh, <laughs> you all have to be at your full capacity for me to pull this off. So, so it's that's different. So that piece scares the hell out of me. And actually, I remember, because uh, actually uh, we have a, a patron named Reeves Bird who actually was uh, wanted to host a... A reception for you. He's a huge fan of yours, and he's met you on many occasions. Uh, and he'll be he'll be joining us if he's not already not online. But we were talking about the third piano concerto, and I got to say that piece scares the hell out of me as a conductor. Um, and that's the easy part uh, because there are so many notes per square inch that just just go fly by that sometimes. I have no idea if we're even together until 20 bars down the road. <laughs> and then there's, oh, God, we're together. Good. And then uncertainty for another 30, 40 bars. I mean, it's like, whew, it's a nail biter. And like I say, I've got the easy job. Uh, when people actually look at the score of the, uh, you know, it's like uh, that is stretching the bounds of what's humanly possible, don't you think? <laughs> I think it is really hard to... Um, for this to feel like we're going to be fine no matter what, for this piece to actually get to that place, not only does it take like technical excellence, but we have to trust each other. Like when you feel, I mean, because it's such emotional huh. music, it's great stuff. That yeah. when it feels like, you know, the, the wheel is a little bit loose, you know, that, that, I don't know. She's not exactly with me, but I might be taking my my artistic freedom and pouring from the heart. And maybe I'm just a little bit off on purpose, you know, in, in my little, you know, interesting bubble. Uh, and maybe she'll return, but maybe she won't. Maybe she's totally off. <laughs> Once you start sort of, you know, that, that gets a little dicey, then I feel like the whole thing becomes very, very strange. So there has to be um, 
a complete trust of like when things are a little bit loose, it's like, oh no, go ahead, take your journey. I'll be here when you come back. Hey, and then fun. and that's then we meet at the credential point, and then we we hook, and then and then we go on to the next chapter. You know, there has to be this give and take that is so organic in a way in this piece, and um, and and we have to be. I mean, after playing it so many times. Uh, that's that's the only thing that's helpful. The hard things don't really get much easier. It's like hard every time, and no matter how much you practice, it's still hard. What is easier is that I know where those places are. Yeah. So first time when you know this instability happens between the orchestra and the piano, or in the piano part, you totally freak out. You're like, oh my god, this whole thing is going to flip upside down. And then, but. When you do it again and again, you notice those places, and when there's a little bump, it's like you're skiing, and then there's that weird rock that always makes you kind of wobbly, like you're about to, you know, spiral down the mountain. You're like, oh, hello, rock. I I know you're there. Yeah, and Ed has Ed, sort of... Ed Carr knows all about face planting on a ski hill. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, hey, uh, hold that thought, because I'm going to check the chat room to see who is all in, so you can say hi. Donna Nolan, good to see you. Yes, Steve Shanley is a genius. He's awesome. Um, uh, well, uh, Blaine Cunningham, man, Steve, you're getting lots of, uh, lots of uh, kudos. Let's see here. Randy Wet Reynolds, you say wow. Can you... Um, can you expand on that? Uh, we, have, we only have one of the finest uh, pianists in the world here. Uh, wow is a good start. Uh, come up. I'll uh, take wow. Yeah, she's going to take wow. Yep. <laughs> All right. Um, and I see Siobhan going, woo! Yeah, God love you. All right. So that's what's going on in the, oops, on the chat room. So, um, so you know where the hard parts are. So what about... Um, the discipline to put your mind ahead of the chaos that's coming. Uh, you know, do, do you find that you have to listen and think ahead of your hands, or do you ever just let go and let your hands do the walking? I try to stay in the moment, that exact moment, which is really hard with a piece like Rock Mind and a Third. Um, there are places I definitely worry, um, and not even ahead, but you know, as performers, I feel like one of the hardest things we have to do is be at total Zen place at peace with what already happened. Yeah, yeah. And Amen. it's always something a little different than what you imagined. And when something happens, I think the worst thing is for you to think about stuff that you got to let it go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why did the flutes do that today? Maybe I wasn't clear. Um, <laughs> but did I answer them in the right way? Oh, that was really great when the strings came out, you know, bloomed a little more today. I hope I responded okay. You know, these like thoughts that have nothing to do with what I'm doing now, you know, these bubbles, you need to basically pop them as you go. They just have to go away so you can navigate forward. And that really is hard. I try to... Um, you know, not worry, but look forward to the hard parts that's coming up. It's sort of like you have to give your fingers and your system a pep talk. It's like, okay, everybody, you've worked so hard. You got this. I know you got this. We're going to go for it. Do not shy, be shy now. And it's like you have everything. You, you have to kind of believe that you can make it in order for you to be able to get through this piece. And that's, that's really... Um, it's very different from other pieces because there is um, no resting. Even when it's slow and people think, oh, now she can just kind of take it easy. No, no. Yeah. it's so gnarly for the mind. Um, and uh, you can't ever just sit back and sort of be like, oh, that's nice. Now I can gather my energy. No, you're co constantly like 100% moving as fast and accurate as possible. So I think that's why it's hard. There is no like shades of easy and hard. It's just all hard. Right. And if you start worrying about it, every single thing will, will seem like it's an impossible task. 
So post-performance then, for something so mountainous as Rachmaninoff Third Piano Concerto, do you have a warm down, sort of like an athlete, or do you like go out and like, like eat an entire pizza? Or, I, I mean, what's your, what's your post-concert meltdown routine? Post-concert? Post, post, yeah. The celebration part. Post-concert, I have celebrations after every concert. <laughs> <laughs> deserves a celebration. Well, I think um, Rachmaninoff third. Yeah, I think I'm allowed extra 500 calories or so for sure. There you go. Uh, it, it really is aerobic. I mean, I am soaked um, when it's over and you absolutely cannot wear a silk dress when, when you're playing Rachmaninoff third because you'll be just Everything will be clinging on to you. You need a dress that's... Okay, um, hold on. I'm taking notes here. Note to self, uh, when I, we do it, I won't wear a silk dress. Okay, got it. Right. Uh, no silk dress. Got it. Yeah. And it, I learned it the hard way. I mean, sometimes, you know, you, you they take pictures of you after you finish. And when you wear those dresses, you look like absolutely crazy because you have these like blobs of different color uh, <laughs> because you're just... It's, it's really draining in every way. So I don't know. What do I do? I do eat a lot after I finish. I don't really eat before I play. I usually stop eating around 3 o'clock or so for an 8 o'clock concert. So from 3 till by the time I get to the restaurant, it'll be, you know, midnight, right. uh, past midnight. So nine hours later, I'm usually very hungry and and very thirsty, but the important thing is I eat something right after I finish, like after Rachmaninoff third, I go into my dressing room before I come out and have a drink, I, I eat an energy bar because that really saves me from eating like five different dishes two hours later. It just, I have to level my myself. So I don't just wolf down everything I see two hours later. It's sort of, <laughs> it's better. <laughs> Not as exciting, but it's better. Pivoting to something completely different, I think one of the difficult challenges for everybody is to keep their mission and their message in front of their patrons and in, t in, in front of the, their followers and the people who love, love you the most. Um, in one way, it's hard enough for symphony orchestras to do that, but it must be even harder for individuals and soloists like yourself. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing with uh, uh, Patreon and, and other uh, formats like that. So after a few months of not going to play any concerts, I've been home really all the time since mid-March. I felt pretty disconnected from my audience and I'm used to interacting with so many wonderful people and colleagues and it's really a lonely world. And uh, I really wanted to, uh, do some kind of project that's meaningful for myself and people that um, follow my work. And so after first few months of just staying totally silent and just working hours and hours every day, trying to learn new repertoire, I was like, okay, I need to come out and do something. Um, I've decided to reveal my behind the scenes process, how I practice. I'm, I was always not very comfortable showing that side because, you know, I don't, I don't want to appear human. <laughs> I want, I want to. Like, oh, heaven forbid! Okay, yeah, strike that from it, Ed. Just, 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 all right, okay. I want to appear and be like, oh, I just this is. Oh, it's this like falling off a log. How hard could this be? Yeah, that's right. That's not right. like so. Sometimes I tell people like. You know, it takes me like a hundred hours to play this little piece. They go, "Oh well, I can do that," <laughs> you know. <laughs> and and it's like, I'm like, does that take the mystery out of what I go through every this agony, this you know, hours of just splitting hair after hair after hair? And I was like, I don't know if people would find this process helpful or useful or interesting. But I started to make these little videos, and in order to um, share that with others i chose a platform called patreon.com which people it's like a subscription service it's like netflix for um 
for individuals. If you want to see me make two or three videos like this a week, then you become my supporter. And and then we can really interact one-on-one. -on -one. You can ask me whatever you want. And I make another little video about it, have a drink, answer your questions, or you know, I'm playing from my living room and say, what do you think of this? Um, that I actually made a few of those videos, but it was so hideous to me when I was reviewing them that I discarded all of them. But um, <laughs> it's coming. The acceptable version is coming. Um, so it's 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 a way to connect. So I have a lovely little group of people that I interact with um, as of a month ago, and we do all kinds of. Uh, uh, things together and I, I like to know what you find um, cur what you're curious about um, regarding what I do so I like sort of changing my my program so it's it's actually beneficial to the people listening not just you know me performing and you listening and you know I'm like this is what I got whether you like it or not but I'm actually you know responding to your needs and um, we're working together like like old friends well actually if you can if you uh tap on joyce yang's name on our uh, episode description it'll send you right uh, links to her url straight to that that site so uh for more information just just click on her name um so whether it's lessons or performing or or just talking to a video um, so much of what we do, or what you do especially, is about nuance. <clears throat> now, we were just talking about Rock 3, which is a highly athletic achievement, not without its nuance, uh, but uh, let's go the opposite extreme now. Let's go, let's go to Mozart, for example. Um, if you're teaching or you're communicating online, how difficult is it to use these tools to convey what you're trying to teach a student or a, a fellow colleague? It is difficult because unless you have an absolutely incredible microphone and sound system, uh, what I'm trying to describe would be, um, I'll be like, here's option A and here's option B, and they're gonna sound exactly the same to you. And I have to make a real distinction um, between two versions so I can be like, B is what I'm looking for. You know, So I actually use them um, whatever analogies I can, you know, it's like this kind of piano is touching a still pond and you have to see the ripples. And you, if you go like that, it's going to, you know, splash and really touch it gently. You know, this kind of um, metaphors or this images, I'm, I'm, I'm really deeply drawn by images and, and I think of colors and shapes when I play. So, I describe it like that a lot. And within the touch, how heavy your arm should be, I, I bring my little squishy dolls. And I'm like, if the whole face does not get squished, that doesn't, it's it's not going to create that warm piano sound that you're looking for. Yes, you're going to be the Going like, oh, not like this, but like this. But I'm trying to really dive into other things that you can be like, oh, yeah, okay, I know what you mean by that. So, it, it takes a lot of sort of creative ways of describing things because normal interaction in person, that kind of thing would be get, get lost pretty easily. Hold that thought. I'm going to come back to you and talk about color. Uh, but I'm going to go back to the chat room to see if everyone's behaving themselves. Oops, I don't have my chat room <laughs> any, anymore. Um, oops. Well, I'm sorry. Technologically, I just lost my chat room. So I guess I can't. I, uh, so to everyone who's following along, sorry, I can't read your, your comments right now. Uh, Ed, can you uh, follow along to see if there's a question that, that they're dying to ask? And I'll ask Joyce on, on their behalf. Uh, so I, when I asked you to see if you would join us, um, I, I, I did a funny quip that is actually more, more serious than not. Uh, one of my favorite television shows is um, Jerry Seinfeld's Comedians in Cars Having Coffee. I love that series. And one of the reasons I love that series is they're always talking about the craft. So let's talk about the craft of being a pianist. Who are some of the uh, uh, pianists, pick one, living or dead, um, that you find extraordinary and does something just better than most people? I'm a diehard Christian Zimmerman fan. Mm. Yep. Have you ever met him? I it's all, all recording, and I have actually never heard him live. But he 
he can break every rule I have as a pianist and I would want to know why. Or I'd, I'd just be like, oh, I was wrong this entire time after <laughs> hearing him play it like that. It's There's something, um, his narrative is so powerful that um, I think that's what a great, greatest artist can do. It makes you forget everything you knew about anything and feel like you've heard this piece for the first time. And um, even though I have heard it 5,000 times before and can play every note myself, everything goes out the window and suddenly I know nothing. And I, I, and I listen to his rendition like I've never heard it before. And actually, most of the time, I am a bit offended. <laughs> why why it's, offended? It's almost like, how dare you play that phrase like that? Because it's probably a piece I love and I have a strict image or idea of how certain things should go in that piece. Because it's like, I've already made friends with that piece. I've already given it all my heart. And we've had a lot of talks between me and that composer and, you know, in my mind. Right. And I thought I knew it. And then he plays it. And then I go, no, 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 no. In the beginning, it's like, no, no, that's, I don't like it. I, I hate it so much. I, I can't tell you um, how much I disagree. And then as I listen to the piece, little by little, I'm like, oh, hmm, there is a, okay, I, I like that, okay. I, okay, I can see it like a different point of view, but I can see where you're coming from. And by the end of his performance, I am like kneeling and being like, <laughs> this is the way, you know, like I'm, I totally changed my opinion and it's that, that being able to be so convincing in your unique voice that if you're able to turn somebody who's who believes something totally different to see your point of view and and be moved by it, I think that's the greatest. Um, that skill really can't um, compare to any other skill. That's something I'm working on constantly because when I perform. Not everyone's going to agree. And I know that there's going to be people like, oh, that's not how Chopin's music should go. It's, it's all weird. That's, that's not it. I prefer Rubinstein's, you know, recording of it. And what she's doing is, is not what I like. But there has, if it's, a, if it's an extraordinary and honest voice, it should have the ability to for that person to go, oh, it's very different, but yes, eh, I can see, okay, okay, I can see how that could work. You know, this kind of ability to bend someone's um, firm beliefs. I think that's true artistry at work. And Christian Zimmerman really does that almost all the time to me. Like I go to his recording when I think I know what I'm talking about. I put on his recording and it's like, oh, right, there's- God, why did I think of that? Ah! <laughs> yes, that's just really <laughs> And the thing is like, of course, I mean, people ask me this all the time. Do you try to imitate then that version or do you stick to your, your interpretation? And, you know, when you hear someone great, it's, it's impossible for you to ignore it because you've already been inspired. Their version, has already made an impression on you. And whether I'm thinking about it or not, it has changed me already. And um, and then, but here's the weird part. I mean, I love Emil Gilles, um, yeah. Yeah. one yeah. of my heroes. And I look at, I listen to his recording whenever I have the chance. And um, and if, if there's something I, I think it's the best. There's no other b better way of playing that phrase. And I try to imitate it for hours. Like, I'm just like, okay, now that voice thing comes up. What does he do? Oh, a little bit more. And then, and then it's, it's like that and this, and then I try to make it the same. And then I remember playing it in the concert exactly as I remember it. And then I was thinking to myself on stage, just like, oh God, I hope no one notices that this is not my interpretation, but I'm 
simply imitating Emil Gillels. I have to tell you, uh, one of my first recordings that I ever owned and I completely wore out was Gillels playing uh, the fifth uh, Beethoven piano concerto. Oh. And, and you know, which is, it's a great recording. And it, it, it's, uh, so a lot of these older recordings, whether it's Gillels or Carrion or something like that, even though when I approach Beethoven and I think I have my own point of view and I have a little bit of early performance practice versus, I still can't get those old recordings out of my head because they were the first to make an impression on me. Um, did, yeah. Did you have something the same like that? There is, I, I think Emma is especially, there is a, a raw energy there that um, it's the kind of thing, if there's a flaw in it, it's not something modern technology can... Um, edit because it's it's uh, momentous. It has yeah. it, it has such energy going the, the the weaving through the lines that if you sort of like cut and paste, it just wouldn't work. His his lines are just so it's so huge and it's so linear and um, and s certain recordings I feel are probably could. It, it's very blocky sounding. I don't know if that has something to do with the way it was um, uh, recorded, but um, it's not something I would change. Yeah, there's something about it in these old recordings that's like I can hear something other than the music making that I would I wouldn't ch um, change it for the world. I'm sorry. Going back to my old story, so I I imitated his interpretation. And then I listened to the performance recording of myself playing that phrase, the very phrase I was so embarrassed I'm copying someone else. And it sounded totally different. Yeah. So that's when I realized you can't, you can try to imitate somebody, but I'm sorry, you're just going to end up sounding like yourself whether you like it or not. No, I think that's beautiful because it, it, it infects your opinion. I mean, it it, it 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 changes the way you think about. It. But at the at the end of the day, you can't really copy somebody else just because you've got this thing called DNA. Now, hold that thought. Uh, Blaine Cunningham said, getting back to our uh, conversation about practicing. I love this, uh, Blaine. He's our librarian and our principal tuba. If I recorded my practice sessions for a public audience, I would need someone to do a lot of bleeping for me. Um, so do you swear while you're practicing? Do you swear? Or do you swear <laughs> during performances? You know, I <laughs> there is a lot of outtakes when I'm making these little videos for Patreon. That's for sure. <laughs> There should be a secret tier of people that actually get to see the outtakes that I'm like, what are you talking about? And I'm just screaming at myself um, when it's not going well. Yeah, when I'm practicing, it's, um, I was actually recording myself to submit to a digital season at Seattle Chamber Music. And I have no engineer, you know, that can help me edit so it had to be one clean take hey, look, world call up ed he'd be happy to help you ed, yeah, <laughs> he's all over it <laughs> so it was a nine minute piece that i had to you know take the best take you know no, right. no cutting and pasting and there were some some words coming out of my living room Cre creative when vocabulary I, yeah sometimes i'm like at nine minutes and 12 seconds, the piece ends at nine minutes and 25. And suddenly out of nowhere, I would make this colossal mistake. And that was the best take. And I would go, <laughs> <laughs> and the whole house would shake. <laughs> it's good to know that you're human. Um, getting back to um, great masters who you admire for a variety of reasons. It can be their musicianship, it can be their professional standards, their behaviors, whatever. Um, talk about, um, so there's a lot of uh, pianists, there's one school, you know, where um, you can hardly see them move, and there's yeah. others where they're swooning all over the place. Uh, obviously, uh, part of it is just your natural body rhythms, but talk about the mechanics of playing. From, a, from an audience point of view when they're seeing a pianist, whether it's just the complete still water or the over-effusive thing? Actually, it's easier to move a lot, I think, than sit still. Sitting perfectly still and making a thousand different kinds of sounds, 
that's really hard. Um, you're really controlling it within your fingers. And it, it, it's, um, it's so much easier when your fingers are an extension of your body. And so, of course, it should originate somewhere from the back, from the shoulder, from the your, your lower half of the body. So a lot of um, sound production for me, um, because I'm not a giant and I can't just, you know, work with my the weight of my arms, I really have to sometimes stand on my arms in order to be heard above the orchestra in certain places. Um, so there will be a lot of leaning. I'm barely sitting on the bench. I'm basically doing a squat and then, or doing a handstand in certain parts of the, um, the piece. This wailing, you know, moving your arms this way. Mm, for me, when you see me going like this, it's because I have attacked the note from the keys and then this is an aftermath. You know, because to, for me to make an extraordinarily loud sound, I'm not going to attack it from the air going down. It would be always from the key and then, and then sort of, and then moving into it and then going away from it as, as, as powerfully as possible with all the weight that I have. So it's kind of aftermath of the, of the music, but um, well, let me follow that up with, because as a conductor, one of my favorite conductors is Carlos Kleiber, who's just one of the most poetic, beautiful conductors, if you ever see video of, of him. What are some of the pianists out there whose approach to piano, uh, pianism, I mean, looks so natural, looks so fluid, looks so easy that it just makes you sick when you, <laughs> when you see them play? The other day I was watching Arturo Benedict. That he, uh, um, Michelangeli play yeah. Ravel concerto, and he was like seriously not moving. <laughs> it's like it's like some weird dark magic because he's barely <laughs> moving and getting such variety of sounds. And it's like how is that happening right now? And it's 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 a big mystery sometimes. But their their fingertips just must be so spicy that it, it can just create um, you know change the weight and then the touch just by the fingertips. I have to you know, really do things with my body to make that change. So, um, and I think, yeah, certain things Martha Argridge does. I'm like, no, I don't know how that's, I don't know how she's doing that. <laughs> yeah. It's it's something so above what makes sense that, um, but it's it's also, I'm, I'm sure though, all these people that are able to make this extraordinary music and technique, it's, um, it's always what they look like versus what you hear. So sometimes, you know, you see this one movement, but you, you hear six different things. So it's like, it becomes like this magical thing, except it's, it's, it's a kind of technique of moving as little as possible to get the maximum effect, which was actually the school I came from um, with my teacher, Beta Kaplinski at Juilliard. It was like, I don't want to contort my body or my hand in any way that would be bad for my health. Leave it as is. You know, hands are like star-shaped objects, and then we have to play the piano that's all parallel from each other. So if you try to fit your hand to, to you know, what the piano looks like, you will get hurt. So how do you navigate by just leaving your hands looking like a star and, and navigating through this instrument that looks totally different? So that was really the what we always talked about. So never, you know, never going like this or, or sort of stretching in a weird way that, you know, if you do this for five minutes, you know, things are going to hurt all over the body. So it, it was, is it ergonomic? It's, it's, it's sort of realizing what you can do without, with minimal effort to get the maximum effect. Uh, can you stick around for another five minutes or so? Yeah. Uh, do you need a refill? <laughs> I need a refill. You need a refill. <laughs> uh, everybody in the chat room, I'm back online. I can see what's going on. Um, <laughs> Joyce isn't going to be with us for much longer. Uh, so, oh, I just swiped off the. <laughs> Sorry, Ed. I just swiped it off. Uh, put in your questions now, so we can so you can ask Joyce directly some of your some of your questions. Anyhow, um, I'm having a terrible time with technology today. So now that uh, you're part of, uh, you've been surviving through the pandemic. How much has it changed your practicing uh, routine? 
uh, because you, you know right now I know for the fact that from the waist down you're still in your pajamas. So um, how how has this changed how you practice and approach your work? I am mainly doing uh, work on new pieces. I think it's Defi really hard. Define new pieces. Are you talking new music or standard rep that you just haven't gotten around to or what? The pieces I always wanted to learn that I didn't have time for. So now is the time. I have the time. So if I don't do it now, then, you know, there will be no more uh, pockets of, of this total... Um, bubbles of freedom you know I, I really try to think of it as my golden opportunity that i can really dive into it without any distractions and um so i learned uh, uh first i learned mozart d minor piano concerto <gasps> okay good for you I, this late in the game that is c minor d minor i mean i would have thought you would have started that when you were like fresh out of the womb Exactly. I don't know how many concerts I've lost because people wanted me to play the D minor Mozart and I said, you know, I don't play that piece. And I, it's, it's just been killing me. So that was my number one. And then I learned the Liszt Concerto, first Liszt Concerto. The first, okay. And then, um, and then I, I play all the f five Beethoven concerti, but I don't play the choral fantasy. So I learned the figured out how that goes. And then I learned um, Beethoven's Hammerklavier, oh, which yeah. it, um, I put in 200 hours of very hard work. Um, it was about five hours a day. Um, and just when I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna just really concentrate and do everything I can for 100 hours. And then when I reached 100 hours, I knew nothing. Isn't it so amazing? I was like, okay, another hundred hours. Isn't it amazing that piece is almost two hundred some years old and it's still like one of the hardest ever written? I mean, it's yes. just, it's like, and such crazy things are happening. I'm like, no, this cannot be right. I must have a wrong edition. It can't be this crazy at this time. It's like some some Schoenberg business over here. Yeah. And then so I have to like compare editions. I'm like, no, that. That clash is really real. And then, you know, go back and try to figure it out again. So after 200 hours, I memorized it. And, you know, it's like I kind of, uh, there is hope. So, you know, a little bit. <laughs> I'm hopeful that one day I'd be able to play it really well. Well, you give me, you give me inspiration <laughs> okay. because the last time you were here, which was like three years ago, I said, I'm, I'm starting to learn the, the Brahms B major trio. And I'm still working at it, you know, and, um, oh, it's it, well, it's potentially great, but not in my hands. Oh. <laughs> but you give me hope because you're the ones, you know, I've done the scientific research that, you know, sort of half-hearted, sort of occasional undisciplined um, pr uh, practice, you know, does it really yield results? And I can tell you so far, my, my findings are eh, not so much. So uh, the fact that that you who are a professional, who are like so disciplined at this, I mean, you still have to really work at all this stuff. I mean, uh, sorry, you're about to say. Certain pieces just naturally get better on its own if you put in the honest work. Certain pieces don't. They don't get better. They just sit as its stubborn little, you know, <laughs> and it just won't get better no matter what you do. That's when you have to, you know, take it to another level. Like, no, I'm not moving until this is better. Like, I have to make progress before I eat lunch. Like world could end and I'm gonna still be doing these two measures. I'm gonna do it until I understand it, until I see some light at the end of the tunnel. It, you have to get kind of, get to that point with certain pieces because they're stubborn. And yeah. Hamaklavier is one of them. It's just like, no, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. And oh. you just have to dig, dig, dig and then after, doing the same page for weeks and weeks and you're like, oh, 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 there's something. I see something very far away. There's a shape suddenly. <laughs> and actually that moment is like, it's so wonderful that it's like actually worth all the pain and suffering. And I'm sure when I get to the stage and um, 
suddenly, I mean, it, it, it started to happen. There's like three different chords when I play. It's like suddenly like I shook hands with Beethoven. I mean, I never felt that in my entire life. Really? He tends to give me the finger. <laughs> <laughs> he likes you a whole lot more than he likes me. <laughs> Like a totally crazy person, I actually said like, oh, hello, you know, like, here you are, Mr. Beethoven. Like, I don't know, I kind of, there were a glimpse of within that 200 hours where, where I just like, you know, there is the heart of gotcha. Beethoven. That chord, I mean, it, it's just a G major chord, but suddenly like all the, like you're a different person after you, just, you know, that, that's, that those are the joys of working. 98% um, is just like pure frustration for me, <laughs> trying to find the answer. And then, you know, once in a blue moon, you know, something works and, and then you're addicted to make progress so you can really get to the, it all together. Mm. <laughs> God bless you, Joyce. You're going to be here shortly uh, to perform with us, and I, need, I know that everybody who's online and who follows you and loves you are going to be at that performance. But how, do you want to come back and do this again? This was a whole lot of fun uh, sharing a cocktail oh, with you. A lot of fun. Yeah, will you be back? Will you come and back? I'll do. I'll do the better um, entrance. Um... Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Excellent. No problem. We'll get that. We'll get that down just just perfectly. So in the meantime, though, you can follow Joyce on her Patreon um, uh, platform. You can just touch her name on the uh, on our episode uh, description, and it, it should just look link up to her URL. So. Um, uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you for saying yes. A big thank you to Steve Shanley who wrote my theme song. And I think once we get used to this theme song, I'm going to start a competition of who can write the most clever lyrics. Another pl uh, p um, uh, another um, prize for who can write the most silly, stupid lyrics and who can write the dirtiest and the most inappropriate. So there we go. So with that, Ed, let's go out with a little bit of uh, my theme song. Oh, yeah, baby.